Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope all of you are having a lovely Friday as we get things kicked off here. Uh, Hey, we have a great show planned for you because we have a regular here on the program with uh with ralph bond and uh you know he is our computer and uh, I'm, I'm sorry our science and tech trends correspondent there we go uh new title there because you know what we focus on i think that better encap uh, encapsulates what uh what it is that we do here so we have a whole show with him it's going to be a lot of fun you're going to love it and in the meantime a couple of things before we get started with him including computeramerica.com that is where you'll find everything from all the articles that we will be reading from any videos that we show any uh, just anything that we that we reference here on the program you can find it in one place and again that's computeramerica.com and you can find it right there find today's show and you'll be able to see everything right there. While you're at Computer America, be sure to check out the social media contest brought to you by Logitech, and be sure to check out the live video stream brought to you by OWC. All right, so all that being said, why don't we just go ahead and get things kicked off here? So we're going to read this, uh, you know, this little bio that we have here for Ralph, and he's going to correct us on how outdated it is. So, Ralph Bond, he is a, cor- a correspondent for the Computer America Show and is the author of Family Computer Fun Digital Ideas Using Your Photos, Movies, and Music by Q Publishing and co author of the PC Dad's Guide to Becoming a Computer Smart Parent by Dell Publishing. Ralph was Intel's Consumer Education Manager for more than 10 years and, of course, for over 10 years was also with Autodesk Communications Team and recently retired and more fully ready to invest himself in Computer America. Everyone, Ralph Bond. Ralph, how you doing? I'm doing great. And hey, that's perfect intro. Works well. The books are ancient history now. Gosh, it's so many years ago we did those books. But anyway, and I just finished uh, working for Autodesk, which was an amazing adventure. Just love it. And now you see my life is dedicated to you, Ben, (laughs) and the audience and these topics that we're going to go through today and just got some great stories to share today. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you uh, you certainly outdid yourself this week and <laughs> there's a lot of great ones. So just go ahead and give everyone a quick overview of what it is that uh, that you try to do here on, you know, for, for the hour. Yes, that's perfect because I always like to do kind of a truth and lending disclosure from the outset. I'm not educated in science. I don't have degrees in science. I'm not a degreed engineer. I was raised, however, by uh, a physicist, a, a chemical engineer, and a mechanical engineer family group that was just <laughs> – so it was like growing up in a house full of Spocks, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I had kind of that – you know, in my blood, if you will. But I went off and did things in history and other good stuff like that, and then wound up in communications in the high tech for, gosh, 32 years, 33 years, whatever it was. And uh, so I have an affinity for science and technology and a love of it, but from a layperson's perspective, so to speak, in a way. And so what I do is I go out and I look for stories that I think would appeal to a wide audience and can shed light on some of the most exciting technology and science advancements going on uh, today. And so that's how I pick the stories. I look at all the different news services and all the different uh, publications and outlets and so forth and cherry pick good stuff to put into our show notes. And the show notes, by the way, everybody, go out to the Computer America website, look for how you can get the show notes. The show notes have the articles I'm going to read from, uh, links, pictures, everything you need to really get the full value. And as Ben can tell you, we never, ever (laughs) get through all the stories that I put together each month, but that's okay because it can be fun follow-on homework for you after today's show. There you go. Very well said. And actually, uh, you know, because I I don't know why, just something you said about science and, you know, being, uh, you know, kind of science inclined, 
that I also want to draw attention to yesterday's show as well. If anyone out there did not catch, you know, in case anyone is time shifting this, uh, if anyone did not catch the July 12th show that we did with, uh, with Ban, the, the Basil Action Network, I uh, highly mm. recommend that you go check it out. It was a lot of fun. And, you know, they are following a lot of important issues, including uh, tracking e-waste and how to protect our environment from the consumer culture that we live in. Because, you know, mm. you go out, you buy a laptop, and then three years later, you go out, throw away that laptop, buy a new one. What happens to your old laptop? Well, they follow it, they track it. And overall, it was almost an hour-long interview, and it was a lot of wow. fun. So. Just want to draw attention to that because that was, uh, again, that was that was a, a great interview. But, Ralph, now we have you, and you are going to have to step up to make sure that we don't we don't ever mention him again. Uh, let's start. I like that. We had a great interview yesterday, and today now we have Ralph. <laughs> no, I'm no, 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 no. You're always fine. But so, hey, hmm? Ben, you were talking about recyclable electronics, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, everybody listening, if you'll go to your browser when when you have a chance. And uh, go to YouTube and type in Bloom, B-L-O-O-M, Bloom, recyclable laptop, keywords like that. And one of the things you'll find is a video interview I did with these students who created just what you're talking about, a laptop. Their concept was a laptop that could be easily disassembled and the parts thereof, when it's outdated, easily recycled. So your comment about uh, yesterday's topic made me think of that. And and check that out. That's a really cool story. Yeah, Stanford, yeah. that's right. Stanford, <clears throat> Autodesk, and no, uh, that's uh, definitely great to hear. And, you know, not to deviate too long because we do want to get mm-hmm. to the stories, but uh, <laughs> w- one of you know one of the topics that, uh, because it's more of a nonprofit organization that works with, uh, you know, the Dells of the world and the Microsofts and blah, 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 who are making cool. the computers. They are, and, you know, he said this during the interview, it was primarily just a think tank idea for now, but... You know, often on the show, whenever let's say the new iPhone 10 comes out, uh, we we follow along the teardown specs. You know, how easy is it to repair oh. something? And they're trying to push an initiative to uh, not exactly like not like instead of like buying a car, you subscribe to like Uber or something like that, where mm-hmm. it's like a, a subscription based model, but for your technology. So companies who make laptops and whatever, instead of making them uber recyclable, which is great, you know, great middle step, uh, they want to push the idea that instead of making computers that are thrown away after three years, design technology that can be rented, used, uh, refurbished continuously, and that way e-waste just never gets thrown away to begin with because these companies have a vested interest in upgrading and maintaining the devices instead of just chucking them in, in the garbage. Yeah, great, great so, topic. I, I love it. That's yeah. just awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a whole great interview. Check that out. But in the meantime, why don't we go ahead <laughs> and get started with story number one. And, you know, honestly, kind of in the same vein, because so much of that e-waste yes. happens to be plastic. And uh, there's a renewed interest in the idea that we should do away with single-use plastic items, especially. Um, Ralph, I'm glad that you picked this one out because plastic yeah. waste has been in the news a lot. This is a fun story. This actually comes from a press release, a press notice issued by Reed. That's R E E D, Reed College. Now, Reed College, some of you who are really deep into computer history, Steve Jobs. Mm-hmm. was at Reed College for a short period of time. Uh, but nonetheless, that's a hugely famous part of the college's uh, history. And it's a very uh, innovative, very challenging, very kind of out-of-box thinking college. That's its history and its its pedigree. So again, Google Reed College, and you can even Google Reed College and Steve Jobs if you're interested in that part of their story. And the reason I mention that is because the story involves a student researcher And let me give you the headline of the announcement from the college. It's bio major breeds microbes that eat plastic. And the subhead was hungry bacteria thrive on plastic water bottles, opening up the possibility of using microorganisms to fight pollution. So perfect for what we were just talking about in a way. It's like you said, a very related uh, story. And if you have the show notes, either you're looking at them now or download them later and look at it. There's a picture here of uh, the major, uh, the woman researcher, Morgan, uh, and it shows her in the lab, which is really fun. But let's get into the story. So it says, bio major Morgan Vague 
V-A-G-U-E. And the 18 that's in the show notes refers to the fact that she's currently in the class of 2018, has isolated and bred three strains of bacteria that consume and degrade, now here I'm going to try this, polyethylene terephthalate. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Say that you, real you, fast. You attempted it. That's great. So Pete, <laughs> or, or, or a pet. So we're going to go. We'll go with PET or PET. I think we'll just go with PET mm-hmm. thereafter. So polyethylene terephthalate. <laughs> and what is PET or PET? It's the ubiquitous plastic used in textiles, packaging, and soft drink containers, opening up the tantalizing possibility of using microbes to fight pollution. Of course, it's a huge, huge problem. PET is an environmental nightmare. The plastic is biologically inert, notoriously resilient, and takes years, even centuries, to break down. Horrifying thought. The estimated 480 billion plastic bottles are manufactured every year. Let that sink in. Oh, my Lord. And after, they have been, after they've served their purpose, many of them wind up in landfills, rivers, uh, and oceans. And I want everyone to Google what I'm about to talk about here. Go out and get Google images or Google this. The infamous Pacific Trash Vortex. And they're talking about the Pacific Ocean. The infamous Pacific Trash Vortex is currently the size of Texas. What they're talking about is this horrifying mass of debris and plastic floating out in the Pacific Ocean. Oh, it's horrifying. Check it out, folks. And it just... It, it'll smack you like a brick to the head how terrible this problem is and how we as, as human beings need to do something about right. this going on. But biologists at Reed have recruited an unlikely ally in the fight against plastic pollution, bacteria. Certain strains of bacteria produce lipase. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's L-I-P-A-S-E, lipase, a fat digesting enzyme that can break down plastic molecules and render them palatable, in theory anyway. Now here comes a quote from Morgan, the researcher, the student researcher, says, her quote is, the problem for most bacteria is that PET is a big, tough molecule with a lot of weird components, says Morgan, who performed the research for her senior thesis, lipase, uh, she says, she goes on to say, lipase is kind of like marinade on a steak. The bacteria squirts out the lipase, and the lipase breaks the plastic into bite-sized pieces. It's, this is so wild. Then there, here's a quote from her professor. Uh, These are very significant results, says Professor Jay Meles, who supervised Morgan's research. It points the way towards a biological means of degrading plastic pollution. At the beginning of her quest, Morgan went hunting for microbes in locations with high levels of petroleum pollution on the theory that those bacteria were most likely to have evolved biological mechanisms for digesting plastic. She traipsed around refineries in her hometown of Houston, Texas, digging up samples of soil, sand, and water around Galveston Bay. She snuck her sam- I love this part. She snuck her samples into re- a refrigerated bag on her flight back to Portland, Oregon, hoping that airport security screeners wouldn't freak out, and they didn't. <laughs> Which is good or bad. I think if I were one of those screeners and I saw these bags of soil, I'd say, uh, "Lady, what's going on?" Here? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a uh, you know strange. <laughs> well, 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 let's face it. The TSA is very on alert lately, and uh, you know if you're coming back with twenty bags of sand. <laughs> eh, something's going on. Yeah, I'd kind of go, uh, what's this? <laughs> anyway, it goes on to say she then uh, she began the long, laborious process of screening her samples for lipase out of roughly 300 separate strains of bacteria. She identified 20 from her soil samples, right? 20 that produced the enzyme. Three of these boasted high levels of lipase. Then came the acid test. Morgan put three test tubes of bacteria on a forced diet of solid plastic consisting of strips she cut out of old bottles of Nestle water that she bought at a Safeway supermarket. (laughs) With no other source of nourishment, the bacteria had a stark choice. Eat plastic or die. (laughs) 
<laughs> Over the course of several weeks, she anxiously monitored the colonies for signs of growth. The first glimmer of hope came when she noticed a tiny colony of bacteria forming on the surface of a strip of PET, suggesting that the microbes might consider the plastic toothsome. I love that. That's so archaic. Toothsome. <laughs> In other words, appetizing. Yeah, okay. Then, on a Monday afternoon, she peered through a microscope and noticed the colony was generating a fluffy structure known as, here we go, extracellular polymeric substance, a telltale sign that it was thriving. Here's a quote from her. I felt like I was on top of a mountain shouting with joy, she says. I sunk so much time and energy into this project, I didn't know if it would work. The, the, the three substrains of bacteria are, and here comes another pronunciation challenge, Pseudomonas putita, putida, mm -hmm. uh, Bacillus cereus, I think, yep. and, here, and a hitherto unknown strain of bacteria tentative, tentatively known as Pseudomonas morganesis. Aww. Self. Morgan, right? That's the young woman's first name. Appears to be the, and she appears to be the first researcher to identify the strain. Now, Professor Meles, the microbiologist who focuses on infectious diseases, says that supervising the project was both a joy and a challenge because he had to go beyond his comfort zone. His quote is, these kinds of projects really push us as professors, he says. It's great because it means we learn together. That is from a teaching point of view of the ideal scenario, I would say. And then it goes on to say, for her thesis, Morgan was honored with the illustrious Class of 21 Award at Reed College, which recognizes quote, creative work of notable character involving an unusual degree of in initiative and spontaneity, which are the things that Reed College highly values, by the way. <laughs> Morgan transferred to Reed from Houston Community College intending to study neuroscience. Then she took an intro to bio class, and she says, I fell in love with biology right then, she says, and then Professor J. Mealy's class on microbiology literally changed my life. More quotes from her goes, as hard as it has been, and Reed has been incredibly difficult at times. And by the way, sub subtopic here, Reed is famous for being a very challenging school. It's a fascinating institution. I encourage readers who are not familiar with Reed College to check it out online. It's, it's an interesting school <laughs> and a beautiful campus, by the way. It looks like something in England. I mean, it's just gorgeous. Anyway, she says, as hard as it's been, and Reed has been incredibly difficult at times, this experience is like no other. The support I've gotten... The, uh, received and the mentoring, the opportunity. There's no other school where an undergrad could do a project like this. I'm so grateful to Reed for giving me a chance. And then now, here's what's going on right now. Morgan will spend the summer, this summer, at Reed experimenting with ways to speed up the bacterial digestion process. This is the key. Right now, it takes months for the bacteria to significantly degrade PET, the plastic and see if it can be deployed on an industrial scale. So in other words, the challenge now is how do we accelerate this process to make it practical and deployable and so forth. And again, if you haven't looked at the pictures or done some, you know, checking on this Pacific vortex, Pacific trash vortex, it's right. horrifying. Do you have a chance, Ben, while I was talking to go out and take a look at some of that? Yeah, it's scary. I, I, I mean, uh, I've done, I definitely seen the pictures before. Uh, unfortunately, uh -huh. the pictures that I saw, they, they always focus on the wildlife, of course, because, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's the most dramatic. And I thought, you know, seeing the pictures of like the otters and the, and the pelicans <laughs> all covered in plastic and oil was just going to be too depressing. So anyways, it's out there. <laughs> Um, it, it's definitely there, it and I—I I mean, just think about the the uh, how you know she would kind of do this, and obviously, uh, smarter minds than than myself are going to be focusing on this. But one thing that I do like the fact that they're using uh, microscopic organisms is yes. that you know while you while you can go look up the you know the the Pacific Ocean trash vortex, and there's a couple more. There's one in the Indian Ocean. Really, there's probably one in every ocean. Uh, you know, yeah, anywhere, anywhere there's a vortex. Uh, but that's only half the story because so much plastic is kind of uh, ripped apart, torn apart, broken down. Uh, you know, through the elements, and they're microscopic. Like they're tiny, tiny, tiny little bits of plastic that make their way into the fish that we eat, that make their way into the water oh, that we yes. drink. Mm. It's And the fact that she was able to do this on a microscopic scale, maybe that's one of the best ways we're going to have to, you know, 
combat this fact that plastic isn't just, you know, it's not just a bag that you can avoid eating. It's l- these little particles that we can't avoid eating. So yeah, maybe she can find yeah. a way to get those out of the, out of the system as well. Oh yeah. Well, it's encouraging and it's exciting research and boy, good old Reed college got a lot of exposure on this story internationally, as you can imagine. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, uh, and so, all right, there's that one plastic, uh, hope for the future. Again, that's another thing that we like about Ralph is that, uh, his stories uh, <laughs> bring hope. They're hopeful. They're good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So let's go ahead and move on over. So, uh, stents, these are things that, um, I've unfortunately become much too familiar with lately with family issues mm. and things like that. I'm mm. sure that you went through a heart surgery. Yes. Uh, yes. you are, you're much too <laughs> intimately associated with stents. <laughs> Um, so story number two, what, what is yeah, this? Yeah, story number two has a real personal ring and it sounds like for you and your family, something that's of interest as well. Uh, also, this is a shameless, another Northwest area story. This comes out of the University of British Columbia. Hooray, our neighbors not, not too far to the North. And the headline was, and this is from a, 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 a Science Daily story, by the way. Uh, the headline is Smart Stent detects narrowing of arteries. So a couple of words of explanation. What is a stent? Um, I've, I had quintuple bypass surgery. That's where they uh, bypass literally uh, damaged uh, veins and arteries to your heart and, and replace them. So I had five of those. And then about mm, about a year and change after that, some of it collapsed in the back because it was very tricky and they warned me that might happen. And as a result, I have five stents inserted into my veins uh, on the backside of my heart. So this is a very personal interest to me. So when I saw this headline, of course, I just zoomed right in on it. So again, we've got the link in the show notes, folks. You can go out to Science Daily, which is a great, great outlet, by the way, and see the picture and all this good stuff. But let's get into this because this is really interesting. Now, in the article, they give kind of a quick summary. I'll read that, and then we'll go into the more intense, uh, in-depth part of it. So the summary is researchers have developed a type of smart stent that monitors even subtle changes in the flow of blood through the artery, detecting the narrowing in its earliest stages and making early diagnosis and treatment possible. So we're going to learn now as we go into the article what why this is so important and, and what happens to stents often when they're inserted into somebody like myself. Uh, so it says, for every three individuals who have had a stent implanted to keep clogged arteries open and prevent a heart attack, at least one, so that's one out of three, one will experience restenosis. I think I'm saying that right. The renewed narrowing of the artery due to plaque buildup or scarring. So heart patients like me, I'm on uh, cholesterol-reducing medications, everything to try to fight plaque, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't address scarring because when you introduce a foreign object into your body, of course, your body reacts to it. And one of the ways it reacts to it is tissue scarring around the stent and so on and so forth. Okay, so plaque buildup or scarring, which can lead to additional complications for the, the stent that's inserted. So it goes on to say, now a team led by the University of British Columbia electrical and computer engineering professor Kanachi Takahata has developed a type of smart stent. So what I like about this, this isn't coming out of the biology department. It's coming out of the electrical and computer engineering group. Isn't that mm-hmm. fun? Yeah. But obviously for, for medical purposes. So Mr. Tanaka and his, his group have developed a type of smart stent that monitors even subtle changes in the flow of blood through the artery, detecting the narrowing in its earliest stages and making early diagnosis, and here's the key, treatment possible. Here's a quote from uh, Professor Takahata. It says, we modified a stent to function as a miniature antenna and added a special microsensor that we developed to continuously track blood flow. The data can then be sent wirelessly. I love this. Can be sent wirelessly to an external reader providing constantly updated information on the artery's condition. Wow, (laughs) it just just blows my mind. The device uses medical grade stainless steel and looks similar to most commercial stents. And again, our show notes have a picture. You can see what it looks like. Researchers say it's the first angioplasty 
Ready Smart Stent. It can be implanted using current medical procedures without modifications. That's important too. And by the way, you can research how stents are inserted, and that alone is an interesting process. <laughs> Research collaborator Dr. York Hsiang, I hope I'm saying that right, H S I A N G, Dr. York Hsiang, a University of British Columbia professor of surgery and a vascular surgeon at Vancouver General Hospital noted that monitoring for restenosis, restenosis pardon me, is critical in managing heart disease. Here comes a quote from him. He says, x-rays such as CT or diagnostic angiograms, which are the standard tools for diagnosis, can be impractical or inconvenient for the patient, he said. Putting a smart stent in place of a standard one can enable physicians to monitor their patient's health more easily and offer treatment, if needed, in a timely manner. So this is so critical. So it, it, let me break that down real quick for everybody. Um, X-rays, uh, CAT scans, that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Diagnostic angiograms, that's where typically what they do is they, uh, well, traditionally they go through through the femoral artery in your leg and they send a, a kind of like a rotor rooter tube <laughs> up right. in there and they inject dye and then they they can watch digitally uh, on a screen live uh, how the flow of the blood is going and detect uh, clogs and that sort of thing so that's what they're talking about that's the way they've had to look at diagnosing stents how are they doing are they having problems are the scarring is there plaque buildup what's going on blah 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 now these smart stents have the possibility of wirelessly and real-time communicating with physicians through monitoring equipment what's going on. So it goes on to say, the device prototype was successfully tested in a lab and in a swine model, poor little piggies. Uh, Takahata, who holds patents for the technology, says his team is planning to establish industry partnerships to further refine the device, put it through clinical trials, and eventually commercialize it. Now, the show notes has a link for even more information you can learn about this from the University of British Columbia. But once again, exciting science, exciting technology advancement, in this case applied to medicine, which, of course, I have a real personal interest in, and you do too, Ben. Right. So there you go. Fun story. I you know, you say poor piggies, but that those piggies have some of the best hearts this side of the country. So, well, this is true. <laughs> so, yeah, but no, it's uh, it's great, and I always love it when they are able to develop these things, and yes. they don't change anything about it because you know, so often in tech we see it's like, hey, we've built the greatest new, uh, you know, and to deviate from like medicine for a minute, yeah, it's like, hey, we built the greatest new messaging platform, and it's like that's great, uh -huh. and it's like, yeah, but you have to download this app, you have to, it only works on this phone, this thing. It's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it may be better from the ground up, but getting everyone to change everything that they already know is is in itself impractical. So the fact yeah. that they're able to use this medical procedure and not change anything, that's great. And the one thing that isn't addressed in this article that I wondered about, maybe you were too as I was reading, mm -hmm. is if this little um, device, this uh, smart stent, is an antenna and so forth, would it not need some kind of power source? And if yes, how does that work? Um, and, and so I wasn't quite sure. Any thoughts on that? Because the, the only thing I think of, and I think you actually did this story with us a little while ago, but I mm. believe you... Uh, it was like using a special kind of conductor uh, to yeah, make that electronics familiar, out of. Was... They were able to use body heat, yeah. I think it was. There was something like, yeah, that sounds familiar. And, I think send, it was maybe... and send very yeah. minute uh, signals yeah. that they could pick up with wireless devices. Yeah, that would be the one outstanding question I would have if I could talk to uh, Professor Takahata. That would be interesting to find out. But anyway, maybe that research paper link. Uh, no, 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 no. Right next to your tailpipe, you now have a 240 plug that you have to plug into the wall. And now <laughs> now every human is going to have a plug. So that's how that's going to work. No, I'm sure it's wireless and it works wonderfully. So you know, it's, it is, it's a cool story. I thought we'd, we'd enjoy hearing about it. <laughs> so Ralph, I'll, I, I got to warn you, we're going to go to break here in like okay. 40 seconds. But uh, let's go ahead and tease story number three and what is that about well the tease here is this is so interesting the science news we'll give you the headline and then we'll come back to it after the break a brain chemical tied to narcolepsy may play a role in opioid addiction heroin and other opioids increase the amount of hypocretin producing nerve cells it does all make sense when we get into the article but it's a really interesting corollary story so something to do with narcolepsy and the, and the role of opioid addiction. And of course, opioid addiction is such a big topic these days. 
that's why I grabbed this story and we'll get into it after the break. Absolutely. And while again, not specifically tech, it is science and it is uplifting to potentially find cures for these horrible, horrible events. So mm -hmm. with that being said, everyone, music means we're going to take a break. Ralph Bond, everyone, uh, science and tech trends correspondent, more Computer America right after this. Everyone, stay tuned. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is, oh, 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here with Ralph Bond. And we are, of course, doing, well, uh, you know, kind of science tech trends news because, again, science tech trends correspondent Ralph Bond. And, yeah, we were just about to get into story number three, half the show gone, and we are three stories in. We're doing well. We're right on pace. So with uh, so with that being said and uh, and – Let's go ahead and continue on with story number three about uh, the tie between narcolepsy and opioid addiction. And, you know, finding any kind of correlation to opioid addiction is going to help, you know, further treatment methods. So this is going to be great. And actually, before we get started, Ralph, I believe your mute button is still on. So, yeah. And you would be correct. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, Ralph, if you would, story number three. Yes. And in fact, in a nutshell. What we're going to find out in this story, this, it's about a possible treatment for narcolepsy that's related to <laughs> opioids. Sorry, but yeah. Okay. Uh, related so it's, to opioids. So it's, a, it's, it's an so interesting it's correlation okay. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So uh, again, since uh, you may be joining us uh, right after the break here, this is a story from Science News, a story by Laurel Hammers is the author. The headline is, A Brain Chemical Tied to Narcolepsy may play a role in opioid addiction. Heroin and other opioids increase the amount of hypocretin producing nerve cells. Now, all this will make sense as we get into the story. And by the way, here we are on story three and past the halfway mark. So that's why, friends, the rest of the stories are homework for you to enjoy and read after the show. So here we go. Using opioids gives some brain cells a call to action. Opioid ad addicts' brains examined after death contain about 50% more nerve cells that release a molecule called hypocretin compared with people who didn't use the drugs, a new study finds. Giving the opiate morphine to mice also induced similar changes in their brains. 
but the increase didn't come from new nerve cells or neurons being born. Instead, once dur- dormant, once dormant neurons appear to rev up their hypocretin machinery in response to the addictive drugs. Researchers report in a June 27 in Science uh, Translational Medicine. The findings fit with a growing body of research that suggests that hypocretin, a brain chemical that regulates wakefulness and arousal, may also be involved in addiction. Now, here comes a quote from one of the researchers. It says, I think there is an extensive evidence now that shows that hypocretin neurons are supporting motivated behavior in general. Close quote. And addiction falls under that umbrella, says Rodrigo Espana, a neurobiologist at Drexel University in Philadelphia, who, by the way, was not involved with the study, but he was just commenting about the study, goes on to say, for example, his lab recently showed that rats with a less sensitive hypocretin receptor and therefore a weaker response to the brain chemical showed less motivation to seek out cocaine rewards. This gets this is a really interesting story. The study now comes from the opposite angle, showing changes in hypocretin neurons in response to drug use rather than the other way around. Here comes another quote. It does suggest the possibility that part of the reason it's so hard to get off drugs is there's this massive change in the brain, says study co-author and neuroscientist Jerome Siegel of the University of California, Los Angeles. I, I, I and, and, you know, just an aside, I've always yeah. wanted to see like the quote unquote grocery list for a research lab like this. It's like, all right, uh, yeah. we need uh, 100 mice, 10 pounds of crack <laughs> and 10 pounds of heroin. And yeah, that should get us through the semester. It's like, uh, OK, that's just an aside. Please. That's continue. an interesting aside. So where do they get their dope? Maybe they get it from police <laughs> confiscations or something. I, well, I think. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? So like the drug version of of cadavers being donated. Oh, well, anyway, (laughs) uh, we digress. Mm -hmm. Going on, it says Siegel and his colleagues didn't set out to study hypocretin's potential link to addiction. That was not their original intent. The brain chemical's greatest claim to fame is perhaps its role in narcolepsy. So here now you get to see how this is coming together. People with the sleep disorder have about 90% fewer hypocretin-producing neurons than normal uh, folks who don't have uh, narcolepsy, Siegel had previously shown. Then when examining brains from healthy donors in the course of their narcolepsy research, he and colleagues got a surprise. A supposedly healthy brain with an unexpectedly large number of hypocretin neurons. It took several, several years to track down the medical records of the donor, Siegel says, but eventually the team learned the person had been a heroin addict. Mm. Now, analysis of four more brains from people addicted to heroin and other opioids suggests that the elevated number of hypocretin neurons in the first brain wasn't a fluke. Addicts' brains had 54% more hypocretin-producing neurons on average than healthy controls, the team found. Follow-up experiments in mice showed that morphine, when given to mice for two weeks, increased the number of hypocretin-producing neurons in the brains. Uh, narcoleptic mice's symptoms have disappeared when injected with morphine. So it's kind of interesting. So you have narcolepsy, which is a terrible disorder. Give yourself morphine and, you know, maybe it can get rid of these things. It's sort of like a double-edged sword, though, because now yeah. you're talking about opioids. Well, but, but it's, you know, maybe there's some variation. Yeah, I, I mean, that's kind of what started this whole opioid ec- epidemic was that it actually does solve some problems like it actually oh. it actually is a good painkiller it's a good uh you know does a number of things and i mean it's great that we're still doing research into other possible benefits from opioids it's just we're also doing research into the negative side effects of opioids so exactly. more complete yeah. picture yeah, yeah. And and here's kind of a key paragraph in the story here. We're almost done. The findings suggest that with proper dosing and monitoring, there's the key, proper dosing and monitoring, opioids might be an effective treatment for some of the roughly 200,000 people in the United States who have narcolepsy, a researcher Siegel says. In the past few years, opioid prescriptions have come under increased scrutiny because of the risk of addiction 
and the nationwide opioid epidemic, which, of course, we're all very well aware of these days. Historically, he says, people with narcolepsy have been treated with addictive stimulant drugs, such as methamphetamine, and that's not so great either, and haven't shown the same desire to keep upping the dose that's seen in addicts. So, again, they might switch over to some opioid derivatives. Further testing is needed to determine whether opioids are actually more effective than other less addictive drugs given for narcolepsy today. So it's just sort of one of these, I love these things where it's a story also about how the researchers were going down one path and then unexpectedly discovered an aspect that led them onto a whole other different research path leading to possible help for uh, narcolepsy, narcolepsy patients. So I, I, that's kind of story. I love these things too. I And I know it's super hard to try to mix, you know, uh, Computer America, consumer electronics mainly, and it's super hard <laughs> to, to mix, uh, you know, drug research and and, uh, you know, that kind of thing into the show. But there's a lot of very interesting research being done, not just in opioids, but in uh, cannabis, of course, but in uh, psychedelics yes. and all these other kinds of yes. drugs. And I know that it's not a very, you know, kind of G-rated kind of thing to talk about, but very good research is coming out of that. So I'm yeah. excited. It, it, and again, that's kind of that's kind of your theme is things that are like, man, I can't wait to see what happens in five, 10, 15, 20 years with this research. So exactly. Uh, so with that being said, though, uh, I was just browsing through the stories and let's see if I remember this correctly, six, eight and 11. Those are the three I want to try to get through. Uh, sure. Today. You want to so pop let's down skip, to a six? Yeah, let's skip through a few and let's go All to right. number six first, because that one was interesting. You got it. Perfect. So, Scrolling as we speak, almost there. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and it's just there like we so, go. some of your stories. You know, they're they're all you know they're all great. It's just some of them are you know a little bit long. So, folks, yes. again, go check them out in your spare time. Uh, we promise they're worth the read. It's just number six kind of spoke to me. Yeah, this was this is a hoot. So this comes from VentureBeat, great outlet, of course. This was a Business Wire press release issued on the twenty eighth of June. The headline of the release was Transcend Air Corporation announces the, I guess I'll pronounce it, VY400, uh, VY the world's first affordable city-to-city -city vertical takeoff uh, and landing aircraft. So that's what the VTOL acronym stands for. And again, VentureBeat uh, press release. No author cited, just a generalized press release. Transcend Air Corporation announces the development of the VI-400, a six-seat vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, and the proposed launch of a new airline service that will deliver business travelers directly to and from major city centers. You got to go to the article. You got to look at the images, the videos, all this kind of good stuff. The animations are really great. And uh, if you have the show notes, you can see a picture of this little vehicle. It's really kind of remarkable again vertical takeoff and landing gosh the british were doing that with jets many many years ago and it, it, it's not ever really taken off no pun intended that much but i think this might be a really interesting twist on this whole vtol uh, aircraft kind of approach so going on with the press release it says the vi will provide faster more affordable door-to-door -door service than either helicopters or conventional airplanes without the need for airports. Ding, 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 without the need for airports. Transcend will deliver service right from major city centers such as Manhattan and downtown Boston using VTOL-ready landing pads. So these landing pads, of course, could be on top of buildings, for example, right? The VI features a tilt wing fly-by-wire design that flies at 405 miles per hour. Wow. Three times faster than traditional air helicopters with a range of 450 miles. That's significant, right? Transcend plans to launch commuter airline service as early as 2024. The lightweight Carbon fiber VI is the ultimate evolution of a 50-year-old proven concept. So 50 years, we've had vertical takeoff and landing aircraft of some form, right? Mm -hmm. The modern VI will come with low operating costs and enhanced safety by featuring novel advanced avionics and a whole aircraft parachute, a whole aircraft parachute that has already been used uh, in use for nearly 20 years. So I presume that means if the aircraft has some catastrophic mechanical problem, it can deploy a parachute and it did this 
takes care of the entire aircraft, just lands it down, right? Uh, Greg Brule, co-founder and CEO of Transcend, says, quote, this is a necessary and transformative addition to city-to-city transport transportation, pardon me, options, it solves multiple problems at once. We'll take cars off congested roads, reduce pollution around airports, and lower the cost of transportation while drastically reducing travel times. I I would say it's a potential to really impact mass transportation. I I question that. I think this is the kind of thing that very wealthy business people and politicians and whatever military could find extremely attractive. It'll be a very small portion of the population i predict that would maybe, have access to this, use it but it's still cool <laughs> maybe, maybe people who are interested in i don't know like getting away for a weekend you know maybe yes. not like lunch and you know maybe that's not worth six hundred dollars but maybe <laughs> a weekend you know pack a bag and hop in this thing and half an hour later you're in you know a city two hours away that might be yeah. worth it Yes, exactly. No, so, but it's a fun technology, and again, there's a lot of electronics there with the avionics and and uh, so forth. So that's something that's cool. There, really there, fun to think of. There's a long way for them to go. I was checking out their website, you know, kind of yeah. as you were talking, and right. uh, man, they they are in super super early kind of testing phases. Um, right. Like honestly, just seeing their progression because up on their website they have how they've progressed uh, from each prototype. And yeah. the, like the current one looks nothing like it did even two prototypes ago. So uh, it's, uh, you know, they're still very much in the design kind of phase. But hey, I, I think that, you know, between Hyperloops that we've talked about here on the show and many other yeah. times or kinds of uh, transportation, this idea that you can, you know, kind of close in the world where, you know, maybe traveling uh, a thousand miles isn't you know like a whole day of traveling but rather it's mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. an afternoon of traveling mm-hmm. that's exciting to me oh yeah there, there are so many again i i always think to myself may not be for what they purport it would be a, a dramatic reduction in traffic for the masses and so no no what it is it's a specialty solution that i think has military potential of course big business potential um elite upper scale recreational purposes all that <laughs> kind of good stuff and that none of that's bad it's just why do the rich I, get all the cool toys that's not fair well they do initially and then the cost comes down 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 yeah. down but then well, you've got faa you've got to deal with air traffic and so forth so how does this interrelate no you know, these no, kind no, of- no 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 the, the faa you simply do what you want and then you say oh by the way here's what i did and they just keep record they don't care what you're currently doing they just i want- know they should have called it a drone <laughs> A big drone. <laughs> yeah, you know, and honestly, eventually, I wouldn't be surprised if when this finally does get off the ground, no pun intended, uh, yeah. I would not be surprised if, if they actually put a surface like this, if it would be un, you know, like a unmanned guided kind of craft. Yeah. Like, you know, because if it's on like a bus route, um, yeah. you could, you know, if you if was, everything was automated, hey, you could put another person where the pilot should be yeah. and right. you know, make even more money. So. Anyways, there's that. Uh, let's go ahead and skip on over to story number eight, because if we're All lucky, right. we're going to get eight and a bit of story number 11. But story okay, number eight, you got I, I, you know, one of my things is that I don't really like going to the store. I mean, when I'm there, I do what I have to do. Uh, but I, I think I'm with many people, uh, many other millennials when I say going to the store is a chore. There's no real enjoyment to be had there. Um yeah, so story number eight kind of said, Ben, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Plus, if you look at the story number eight, which is from uh, Ars Technica, story by Timothy Lee, headline is, Forget Deliveries. This firm wants to bring a grocery store to your driveway. And there's a subtitle that's a quote, quote, it's not a delivery vehicle. It's an autonomous store on wheels. The CEO of the company in question you're going to find out about uh, says, and if you have the show notes, the picture, I love the design of this, this vehicle, right? I mean, it's just so, that alone got my eye. I said, oh, I've got to do this story because it's so cool looking. Anyway, so let's get on to the story here. It says last month, and so this story was posted at the end of June, uh, we wrote about a wave of startups like Neuro, N-U-R-O, Starship, Neuro Starship, and Marble that are building autonomous delivery vehicles. It's a promising concept. Designers of these vehicles don't need to worry about passenger comfort or safety since there are no passengers, and vehicles can be slow, about 25 miles per hour. 
uh, for Neuro, even slower for Starship and Marble, without irritating anyone inside the vehicle, which greatly simplifies the technical challenges of building, building a fully autonomous vehicle. In our survey of this emerging market, we didn't mention another fascinating startup with a different twist on the same basic concept. Quote, it's not a delivery vehicle, it's an autonomous store on wheels, said Ali Ahmed, A H M E D, um, Ahmed, pardon me, mm -hmm. the CEO of RoboMart. In a Tuesday interview with ours, again, this was published uh, late June, Neuro imagines a future where the customer orders a few produce items and those spe specific items are delivered in an autonomous vehicle. In contrast, RoboMarts, that's the topic of this story, RoboMarts' plan is to effectively send the entire produce aisle to a customer's driveway. And that's well shown in the picture that's in the story right. here. And, and, and actually, speaking of, let me just cut in real quick. Speaking of the picture, yeah. I just sent you a link on Skype uh, of another picture that I wanted you to check out. And let me know if the two kind of uh, seem similar. And it's because, you know, you looked, oh, at yeah. the, you looked at the design of this thing. And while it's much more futuristic, uh, you know, mm -hmm, kind of concept mm -hmm. car-esque looking right. design. Uh, like when I first saw it, I was like, I've seen that before. And it's because of Ollie. Ollie is a self-driving Yes, Ollie, bus. right. Yeah. Yes, you're right. You're right. It's very similar. You're and, absolutely right. And essentially, I saw that, and I'm like, all they did was they kind of took an Ollie, and <laughs> instead of seats, they put uh, grocery shelves on them. And yeah. Yeah, same thing. So I, I thought, it's not too far out there, because it's been done before. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. So, again, it, what their plan is to send an entire produce aisle to a customer's driveway. So I like the idea they're sort of focusing on one aspect of a supermarket, right? Mm -hmm. Not the entire thing. Right. Uh, then the customer walks outside, selects the items he or she wants, and RoboMart automatically charges the credit card that uh, she or the customer has on file. Mm -hmm. Ahmed points to a couple of advantages for this model. For perishable items like produce, customers will appreciate the ability to pick out items for themselves. Now, my age group, I'm 65 years old, we just go, I'm not going to let somebody pick out my bananas for me. I want to pick them. I want to touch and smell the bananas. And, uh, they got to be you know. slightly green. If you get the yellow, by the time you eat them, they're well, already bad. You, you go. got to, you got to, yeah. So my wife and I will say, uh, uh we're not going to have somebody else pick out our produce and deliver it to our door, even though the convenience is appealing. We're, we're still hands-on. Anyway, but so this is a perfect solution to that. It gives you the hands-on combined with technology and convenience, right? Also, he argues, ordering groceries on an app is tedious and time-consuming. It's actually more convenient just to have a bunch of produce show up at your front door so you can pick out what you want. I agree. On top of that, uh, Ahmed argues that this kind of mobile grocery store will be able to make more deliveries per hour because it won't need to return to the store as often as delivery vehicles uh, does. Robomart is such an early stage startup. It was only founded last year that it's impossible to predict if the company will be successful. The company has uh, just seven employees and has only raised seed money so far. For now, the team is punting on one of the biggest technological hurdle the development of autonomous vehicle software. So what they're saying is it's all well and good, but the real hurdle here is really getting autonomous vehicle software to truly work and truly work in such a safe and consistent fashion that it's basically bulletproof, right? And we all know from recent stories about autonomous vehicle crashes and this sort of thing and fatalities that this is far from a perfect world yet. But early Robomart vehicles will be remotely operated by human drivers. So see, there's your comp compromise, it'd be remote control. Eventually, the company plans to switch over to fully autonomous vehicle technology. I actually think the uh, remote control driver thing is more practical. Robomart is building all electrical vehicles with a top speed of 25 miles an hour. So the engineering challenges are somewhat simpler than building a car that can cruise down the freeway at 70 miles. 25 miles an hour? That's, well, yeah. That's even annoying for city streets. I mean... Exactly right. You, But Ben, you nailed a point that I was thinking about when I was reading the earlier part of the uh, article. Talking about... The, the slower speed not bothering the passengers in a vehicle, right? Remember they talked right. about that? Well, you're right. Everybody else is going to, gosh darn it, get that, <laughs> you know, black and white refrigerator I, out of my way. I mean, even, <laughs> I, I feel like even 35 would be mm -hmm. better for, mm -hmm. because, you know, most most neighborhoods and, you know, where people live are 35 top 
25 is like there's cautious and then there's bothersome. Well, yeah. So, so there's a weakness in this story. I agree with you. Yeah. And that's where if you had a human remote control driving the vehicle and it had a ability to go faster, more normal so, speeds, like say 25, uh, 35, 45 for street traffic, right? So, and, and then you could st- keep up with the flow of traffic. Absolutely. So we're not going to get through this whole story. I'm just going to be upfront with everyone. Uh, continue reading, <laughs> of course, in the show notes. But I did want to make another, you know, kind of uh, question about this. And, you know, here in, in uh, you know, where, where we live, there's a pretty big interest in these things of uh, farmer's markets. I'm sure they're all over the country. Yes. Oh, yes. Big they they, they yeah. used to be more popular. Um, and I guess they're kind of making a resurgence where local produce and local farmers, yes. they bring their wares. And I'm not saying that they have to be the new farmer's market. But if these things could come to a central location, if they could be kind of the mobile extension of a oh, grocery store where everyone oh. in a neighborhood would come to it instead of it going okay. to our door. Okay. W- Interesting. Do you think about that? I think that's a really, you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me sort of kind of here in Portland and many, many cities have food carts, right? Yeah, and sometimes they'll take yeah. over abandoned lots or not abandoned lots, but you know, parking lots or whatever that aren't being used. And they just line them up with these food carts and it becomes a, an entertainment destination with choices, and and um, farmers markets are that they're they're half entertainment, half practical, yeah. right? And so you're right on target. What if these vehicles just drove and formed like a, a wagon circle? <laughs> uh, it is in a location every day at a certain time, or or all day, then, or whatever. Yeah, right? and and then whenever they were low on a certain thing, or you know, maybe people could could come restock them, I, or when they were out completely. They just drive back to the store, pick up another supply, and head back out to their next destination. Like, think of it like a uh, not even like an ice cream truck because they have set routes, but you know, just have one place where people kind of come to it, but it's much you know miles more convenient than uh, the central grocery store. Yeah, no, I think you've really that's a very clever, very very get interesting. them on the phone. We have their we have their uh, business model lined up. Get them on the phone. We need them. Yeah, there you go. And I'll tell you another little twist. Uh, assisted living communities where the elderly, some of them still have their little kitchenettes and they're cooking and so forth. But getting to the supermarket is imp- impossible and, and probably culturally and otherwise they might not feel comfortable about doing online deliveries and maybe that's not pro- – but what if these vehicles, to your point, three or four of them could show up in a round-robin kind of um, tour of, of, of assisted living centers yeah. and uh, the elderly could come out and, and and get what they want right there on the spot and yeah so there's you're right there's I think bring it it's there's all kinds of interesting it's, twists to this possibility that's bigger than just this company in this one story and, and and as the story said they're still very very early you know just starting up last year right. but there's I think a bit too much inconvenience when it when it comes to door to door um, I think that's more marketing. It's like, imagine a future where you step out your door and there's an entire yeah. grocery store in front of you. It's like, that's still, you know, two Jetsons for me. But at the same time, <laughs> it, it's the idea that, you know, just having a store, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, between the hours of two and three, there's going right. to be fresh produce uh, down yeah. the street that you can go pick up. It, exactly. That's really cool. You know, I know we don't have much time left, but uh, maybe just highlight a few of the stories sure, that I think everybody would really enjoy. The next one, story number nine. I thought this was so fascinating. Everything's getting smart. Everything's Internet of Things, right? Mm-hmm. The, Ch- the uh, Chinese researchers have come up with hard to burn, smart wallpaper, even triggers alarms. Embedded nanowires respond to heat in a way that can turn on buzzers and warning lights. Wow. I mean, this is, and this comes from Science News for Students, which is a wonderful outlet. It, it really presents information in a very approachable and digestible way, which is good for me. And I encourage you to read this story. And there's a great video, too, that you can uh, see when you go out to the, uh, the online to see the story in its uh, original form. But it's a really cool uh, wallpaper that can contribute to uh, sensing fire. Yeah. danger and so wow i mean that, that i just love that there's, story and and just real quick there's that one and again i really like story number 11 where we always talk about green energy and india yeah. going for a hundred gigawatt uh solar capacity goal yes so you know hey there's those stories and more music's playing in the background ralph we are flat <laughs> out of time 
but um but yeah great stories uh thank you again for coming and uh and hey as always it was a lot of fun and uh tell people if they want to know more about you or more about what we did here today where can they go super easy just google my name ralph bond and then add wix w-i-x and that will give you the link to my personal website and we have the shows available there the shows that i'm on and also a little more information about my background so come on out and check it out all right and we have it right up there and we'll put a link to it in the show notes and in the meantime ralph catch you next month it's uh of course always looking forward to it and as i believe you mentioned before the show stay cool i i, I hear this is getting harder <laughs> Yeah, we're getting the heat now. (laughs) All right. So, and everyone else out there, thank you for joining us here on Computer America. Wow, we're out of time. Bye.